Well, last time, remember, we looked at the first of two final encounters that Paul would have before he boards the ship for Rome. And that was the one before Festus and the Jews. By the time Festus had uh, taken office, Paul had been in custody for two years. Now, usually that would be enough time for one's animosity to subside somewhat, but it wasn't for the Jews because as soon as Festus arrived in Jerusalem, they again came and urged him to bring Paul to Jerusalem to stand trial while secretly plotting to ambush him and put him to death on the way as far as they were concerned. No one who promoted Jesus as effectively as Paul did could live. Now, when Festus returned to Caesarea, the Jews came with him to renew their charges while Paul continued to defend his innocence. And when Festus asked Paul if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem to stand trial, realizing that this was how the Lord was going to bring him to Rome, Paul appealed to Caesar. And he did that even though the Caesar who was in power in those days was the absolute worst Caesar in history, and that is Nero. Now, that's something that R.C. is going to remind us of next, next Lord's Day in the evening when he deals with the beast, because who do you think R.C. believes the beast to be? Okay, but Nero. Now, even in spite of this, Paul expected to be acquitted because he was protected by law. Christianity was not illegal. It was, as far as Rome is concerned, a sect of the Jews. And so he would willingly go to Rome. Jesus told him that he would preach the gospel at Rome. Not that he would die there. And as a matter of fact, we know historically after, after this, that Paul was acquitted. And he went on to continue to promote the work of the gospel until he was later arrested and, and executed, but not on this trip to Rome. Now, last week, we left Paul in Festus' custody as he was waiting to leave for Rome. In the interim, as I've already said, King Agrippa arrived in Caesarea and when he went to pay his respects to Festus, Festus saw this as an opportunity to lay Paul's case before him because he still didn't really know what charges to send with Paul to Rome. And that's because he didn't really understand the issues, as we're going to be reminded again this morning. And of course, not to have done his due diligence, he could very well lose his position if he sends Paul to Rome without specifying the charges. So this is where we pick up the narrative this morning. Again, Paul being brought before Agrippa and this illustrious crowd. So first we see Paul again defending the gospel. Now this time the audience, as I mentioned, was King Agrippa. Festus and the commanders, um, those are the tribunes. And Josephus tells us that there were five such tribunes stationed in Caesarea. A tribune was a man who had charge over a thousand men. These were very important men. And the prominent men of the city, the affluent men, were also there, likely made up of Romans who were both Gentiles and probably a few Jews. So as I've said, this was the most uh, influential, affluent audience that Paul had yet addressed in all of his ministries and all of his missionary travels. Again, I would remind you what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, which is what we looked at for our meditation. He said to his disciples, be on your guard for they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Again, we see this being fulfilled within the time frame that our Lord Jesus said it would, the time frame of that generation, those who were then living when Jesus spoke those words. Okay, we're still pre-70 AD and the Jewish war. Now, what I want us to consider this morning is how Paul goes about it on this occasion, because I think he um, includes something that maybe we don't often think about. So after Paul, or after Agrippa, gave Paul permission to speak, he began uh, acknowledging, first of all, that he was fortunate to do this before Agrippa. Okay, unlike Festus, Agrippa was very familiar with the customs of the Jews. Remember who Agrippa was? You know, he's the son of Agrippa I, who was the son of Herod the Great. And these are the Herods who basically had control of Palestine for quite some time. 
Now, the Emperor Claudius had invested this particular Herod, Agrippa II, uh, with the oversight of the temple at Jerusalem. And this included the care of the temple, the appointment of the high priest. You know, talk about Erastian church government. I mean, that's what we have here, where the government appoints the head of the church. And he also had the care of the sacred vestments. So he had to do with the Jewish faith, with the Jewish religion. And Paul believed that he would then give him a sympathetic hearing because Paul was all about these things, all about the fulfillment of all of these things, as he's going to tell us. Now, the word that Luke uses here, fortunate, is a very unfortunate word because um, we don't really believe in fortune. You know, everything is really planned and carried out by the Lord. The word here is actually the word that's most often translated happy or one we're more familiar with, the word blessed. I'm blessed to be able to do this before you today, Agrippa. Paul saw this as God essentially working in his favor, as he promised that he would, and he wanted those who were present to know that God did this. Okay, he was giving God glory. Paul never hid anything that had to do with his commitment to Christ. Paul was always first and foremost a Christian. He always put his Lord's concerns and his glory before any others, okay? And again, that's an example for us to follow. Certainly, our Lord Jesus did it. Paul is simply walking in his steps, and that's what we are to do as well. Now, next, Paul shared his testimony. Testimony, his experience, that's a very important part of the witness that we are to give to others, okay? What it is we have experienced. By the way, when, when you joined the church, perhaps you remember that the session asked you for your testimony, asked you questions, okay? And the questions were, were basically these, you know, what were you before Jesus came to you? And I put it in those words because we didn't come to Him. Okay, He came to us. We love because He first loved us. He sought us out. He was the great shepherd looking for the lost sheep. So it's not that we did it, but He did it. So what were we like before Jesus came to us? How did he make himself known to us? And how has he changed our lives uh, since he's come? Now, we know from the apologetic seminar that we do need to give others objective evidence, okay? We need to build the case objectively. We need to be able to show that God exists. We need to be able to prove that the Bible is his word. And as I've mentioned, we've been looking at a very important piece of this evidence in the evenings. Let's not forget the prediction that Jesus made in the Olivet Discourse that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed before that generation passed away. That was a very clear prophecy, and it came to pass without dispute. See, that's one prophecy, really. I don't think that any critic can dispute. That's the reason why, again, they try to, to haggle over the other elements in there, not the destruction of the temple, not the destruction of Jerusalem but those other elements and why it's important that we be able to answer those objections, okay? We need to give objective evidence. But there is also subjective evidence, and that's usually what most people give. How do I know Jesus lives? He lives within my heart, okay? That's, well, that's an argument, but it's not a real powerful argument, but it can perhaps be even more powerful than that, okay? Paul gives a very powerful argument of how the gospel changed him. Now, when the Lord comes to us, we know from what the Word of God says we are not going to be the same, right? Because before we were dead, and He's made us alive. Before we hated God, but now we love Him. By the way, that's why Dr. Ferguson in one of the series we were, we were watching may have been in an evening service, I forget, could have been in, in the Wednesdays, but he told us that when Peter writes the passage that we're constantly reminded of by R.C. Sproul as to our obligation to do apologetics, where he says we should always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks us to give an account for the hope that is in us, yet with gentleness and reverence, Dr. Ferguson says that Peter assumes here that those who know us will see a difference in us. When we come to Jesus Christ, things are not the way they were 
because now we have the Spirit of God living within us, working Christ-likeness in us from the inside out. Now, that's exactly what Paul does here. That's what his testimony is all about. Now, he begins with his background. What was he like before Christ? Well, he was born in Tarsus in Cilicia. He doesn't mention that. But at a very young age, his parents took him to Jerusalem to be schooled in the law under Gamaliel. When he was fully grown, uh, went through his bar mitzvah, maybe even a little bit later than that because that usually takes place at 12 or 13, okay, he not only lived by the law, but he joined the ranks of the most zealous for that law. He became a Pharisee. Now, since some of those present, remember who he's talking to. He's not talking to the Jews primarily. He is talking to a primarily Roman Gentile audience since they did not know him. He called on the Jews, perhaps those who were present, but certainly those bringing the accusations to bear witness to the truth that he was a zealous Pharisee because he lived a very public life. These things were not done in a corner, okay? His life was not secretive. He wasn't one of those that just kind of blended in to whatever crowd he was with. Paul was zealous for the truth, even when he was a Pharisee. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why Jesus chose him to be his witness, you know, to the nations because Paul was zealous for whatever he held on to. Now, as Paul thought about his life as a Pharisee, he realized the irony of his situation, that he was now on trial for believing that God had fulfilled the very thing that he is a Pharisee and that all the Pharisees and all the Jews had hoped for their entire lives, that God would send his Messiah. I mean, that, that is exactly why Paul was on trial. And just think of the irony of that, you know? Again, this is what we all wanted. It's happened. And now they want to kill me because I believe it's taken place, even as God said that it would. At this point, he turns from Agrippa to his primarily Gentile audience, and he asks this question in verse 8. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead, okay? We know that Paul was speaking to the Gentiles here because the Jews believed that God could raise the dead. There were examples in the Old Testament of him doing exactly that. But as we know, the Gentiles didn't believe that as we saw at Athens when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, they scoffed at him, right? Now we need to realize, again, that there's many things that depend on the resurrection. We need to bring it into the conversation. We need to be able to demonstrate that also to our audience, don't we? Because those that we speak to are likely going to deny this as well. And that's why R.C. said, let's begin with the existence of God before we insist on the resurrection. Let's prove that the Bible is His, his Word. And let's even use, he would say, the Bible as an historic document that contains eyewitness accounts of those who saw Jesus. Over 500 at one time saw him alive. And if God exists and he's raised Jesus from the dead, we know that the God who created life can certainly restore life. And more important than that, we know that he's going to raise all men, as the Bible says, as he tells us, at the end of time, in order to bring everyone to account before his judgment seat. So again, the resurrection, very important, but Paul, again, just exclaiming, why is it so difficult for you to believe this? God exists. He can do whatever he desires. Well, then Paul turns back to his testimony. Again, that was kind of a parenthesis there. He turns back to his testimony and he says, being a Pharisee, he too was an enemy to Christ and to his people. In Jerusalem, he arrested Christians. When they were on trial, he voted for their execution, for their death. When he found them in the synagogues, he tried to force them to blaspheme, which likely means to renounce Christ and to turn back to the Jewish faith, which, he, which at the time he saw as contradictory. And he even traveled to foreign cities trying to stamp out this heresy. So that's what Paul was like, okay? And they knew that. The Jews knew that. They could testify to that. But all that changed when the Lord found him. 
Okay, while he was on his way to Damascus, remember, to imprison with the clothed with authority from the chief priests, to imprison anyone he found according to the way there, to drag them back to Jerusalem, Jesus appeared to him at noon in a brilliant light. At noon. Okay, when the sun is at its brightest, there was a light that was even brighter than that. When Jesus appears, this brilliant light that sent Paul and those with him to the ground, and Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now notice, first of all, that in persecuting believers, Paul was really persecuting the Lord. Okay, Jesus tells us, and this is something we need to bear in mind, in our relationships to one another, he says that whatever we do to the least of his brethren, we are doing that to him, whether for good or bad. You know, this should make us carefully consider how we treat one another, you know, especially those professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are treating Jesus in the way that we are treating that brother or sister. Paul then asked who, who it was that was talking to him. He, he had never met Christ before, so he didn't know. And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh-oh. <laughs> Paul realized, okay, I'm in trouble. Well, he's already on the ground. Jesus has humbled him. But then Jesus tells him why he appeared. It wasn't to destroy him. Okay, it wasn't to cast him into hell. But actually, he was coming to him not only to redeem him, but also to make him his ambassador. This is the grace and the mercy of God. He takes his greatest enemy and turns him into his greatest friend and, and advocate. I think among all, you know, everyone who's in the Bible, I don't think we can find anyone who loved the Lord more than Paul. Well, Jesus tells him why he appeared, that he might be a witness, that he might tell others what he has seen. What has he seen? The risen Christ. To be an apostle, you need to see the risen Christ. And he was now telling those he was standing before, I have seen the risen Christ. I have seen the resurrected Christ. Jesus says that he would also be the witness of those things he had yet to show him, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Jesus went on to say this would mean suffering for Paul. And by this time, Paul certainly knew quite a bit about that. But he also said that he would be with him and he would deliver him. And he had done that to this point, which is why Paul was there to tell them about Jesus. But he also tells him this, that by telling others what you have seen, Paul, and what you know that the Father has sent his Son, he has sent the Messiah, he has died, he has risen again, that I'm going to use that message to gather my people to myself. I'm going to use it to open the eyes of those who are blind to see who I am. I'm going to turn them from the lies of the enemy to God's truth. I'm going to set them free from Satan's bondage and I'm going to make them free in Christ and the children of God that they might be fully and finally forgiven and gain an inheritance in God's kingdom. He also says in here further, I hope we all see this, that he's going to sanctify them because this is for those who have been sanctified by faith. And the fact is that the Lord doesn't save anyone, that he doesn't at the same time sanctify. Now, there are differing levels of sanctification. There's, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in our lives, but that work will be ongoing, and the Lord will do that. We will turn from our sins to righteousness, and that is how we can know that the Lord has done these things for us. Now, this is what Jesus did for Paul when he was on his way to Damascus. This is what Paul tells us that he does for all who believe in him. Remember what he writes in Ephesians 2.1, writing to the Ephesians. And by the way, it wasn't just the Ephesians. It was everyone okay, in the world. This first part certainly applies to everyone. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's the reason Paul behaved the way he did, why he hated Christ and Christians. And that's the reason why we live the way that we live before we came to Christ. But then he goes on in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And that is the reason why our lives change 
when Jesus comes to us, when He saves us, is because we were dead, but He has made us alive. Now, that's, again, what Paul did. He, he tells Agrippa that at, from that point forward, he obeyed the Lord Jesus. And again, look at the examples. Instead of imprisoning those he found in Damascus, he began to preach the gospel to those who didn't believe. Instead of returning to Jerusalem with prisoners to put on trial and execute, he came with the gospel in order to save them. He went to all Judea. He went to the Gentiles. By this time, he's been on three missionary journeys, telling everyone that they should repent, that they should turn from their sins to God, that they should trust his son Jesus alone to justify them and begin to live the life that God calls them to live. And he's, Paul, Paul says, you know, this, Agrippa, is why the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. <laughs> it's because I was telling other, others that God has fulfilled His promise to our fathers. He has sent the Messiah. Okay? But, he says, Jesus was faithful to His promise and He delivered Him even from the Jews. And again, that's why He was able to stand before Agrippa and this austere audience to declare that what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place has taken place that Jesus the Christ has suffered and died, that he was the first to be raised, never to die again. He's not the first person who was raised from the dead, but he was the first one who was raised never to die again, and that through the apostles he has brought his truth to both Jews and Gentiles. Now again, remember to whom Paul was speaking, right? He's not speaking to a church to a group of people who believe the same things that he did, because we often feel comfortable saying those kinds of things among people who agree with us, right? But he was speaking to this, this crowd that essentially had his life in their hands, although he knew ultimately God did, but people who didn't believe these things. But he didn't hold anything back. He told them the truth, the flat-out truth. This is what they needed to know. Again, Paul was always concerned really about one thing, the glory of God. We might break it down into two, that God be glorified and that his people be gathered through the gospel. That was what Paul was all about. That, that's really what drove him wherever he went. And really, that's what needs to be driving us as well. And that's what the Spirit of God puts in our hearts. But again, we do need to nurture it through the means of grace. We do need to be pursuing the Lord but we will be if we know Him. Now, that's the first point. I have a couple more, but they're very brief. Secondly, we see Festus' reaction. Again, look at Festus in verse 24. He said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Now, as we saw last time, this is how unbelievers view the gospel. This is how many of them are going to see the things that we are sharing with them. And that's, again, why we need to be able to show them. And I think Paul would if he had time. That it's the only reasonable explanation for everything that we see. But it's also the fact that, again, God has to intervene is the reason why we shouldn't be surprised. If even after defending the gospel and giving them the best arguments that, that are absolutely conclusive, that they still look at us the way that Festus looked at Paul, you were crazy, okay? God has to open the eyes of the unbeliever. Otherwise, even the best arguments, they're still going to try to deny them, even if they are absolutely conclusive, okay? God is the one who is sovereign. Now, you know, it's often because we're afraid that others might view us like this that we do not share the gospel, right? We don't want people to think we're crazy, but we do need to remember at times like this what Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Do you know what it means to be ashamed? It means to be reluctant to own something or to say something or do something because we're afraid that what we believe and what we're saying in the end, might prove not actually to be true. 
See, that, that's what causes it, this idea they're going to think we're crazy and maybe that challenge, do I really believe these things strong enough to be a witness of these things and be willing to be thought crazy? Okay, we should never be ashamed of this gospel. This is the, the reason why we believe we're saved. It's because of what the Lord has done. Paul was not ashamed. Again, look at who he's before, the king, the governor, the tribunes, prominent men of the city. If you're going to be afraid to do it in front of somebody or ashamed, this would be the case, but Paul was not ashamed. He always boldly proclaimed this truth. And if he can do that before such an austere crowd, can't we do it before, you know, maybe our family members, our neighbors, people with whom we work, without fear, without shame? We should. Our Lord tells us that that's what we need to do. And He gives us the grace to do that. He gives us the strength. We just simply need to trust Him and stand up and do it. Finally, Paul appealed to Agrippa. He knew that Agrippa was familiar again with what he had been saying. All of, everything that Paul had just said was public knowledge. This was going on all around him. And so he asked him in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And then he says something kind of unexpectedly, I know that you do. Okay. I know that you believe these things. Now again, notice Paul's courage. He's confronting the, the king here. Not, not Nero in this case, but this is the king in Palestine. There was no one he would not evangelize. There was no one he would not challenge with the gospel. Well, he knew Agrippa believed the Old Testament scriptures. Okay, but he also knew that by itself was not enough. You know, we can believe what the Bible says and still not be saved. You know, we, we make that distinction between historic faith and saving faith. Historic faith is I believe the facts, I believe those things are true, but I haven't actually trusted Jesus. Agrippa had historic faith. He believed the prophets, but he had not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. He needed to be born again. That's what Jesus says must take place. There must be the saving work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And again, as far as us personally, we can only know that that has happened when we love and submit to Jesus. It's not a matter of, I, I believe the facts. I pray the prayer. But that I really love Jesus and I'm really seeking to follow Him and submit to Him and bow the knee to Him. Now, Agrippa didn't do this. So he chided Paul, and I think really this is a question rather than a statement. In a short time, will you persuade me to become a Christian? Do you think this is all it's going to take? Is just one time of witnessing to me, so to speak? But then I want you to notice Paul, who then speaks from his heart. Okay, this is what he really desired for Agrippa. I mean, this evil man, remember he's living with his sister as his wife. He is an immoral man. Okay? like his father, like his grandfather. But this is what Paul desires for him. I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day might become as I am, except for these chains, become Christians, but not prisoners necessarily. He wanted them to know Christ. That was his desire. Even these Gentiles, okay, he wanted them to come to know the Savior. Paul had a real love for his neighbor and really wanted them to come to know the Lord. That's the kind of heart that we need, the kind of heart that Christ has. And after he said this, the assembly withdrew to discuss these things. They concluded Paul had really not done anything deserving of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, Paul might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And this tells us that apparently a lesser judge could not release a prisoner once his appeal had been registered. Paul had to go to Rome. But that's exactly where Paul wanted to go. He didn't want to get out, you know. He wanted to go to Rome so that there he might do what Jesus had called him to do, and that is proclaim the gospel. Now next week, we're going to see the beginning of, of that journey. It's going to be fraught with uh, problems along the way as well. But that, what's taking place here again is our Lord's will. He said he was going to bring Paul to Rome, and so Paul knows he's going to get there, right? 
He didn't want to get out of it. He simply wanted to serve his Lord however his Lord called him to serve. Again, may the Lord give us that kind of spirit. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And uh, again, let's, let's use these things. We saw a lot of things. Let's use these things again to examine our hearts and um, to see whether or not um, the Lord has done this work within us and whether we desire to have this kind of heart Paul had. Um, before, before I do uh, bow for prayer, I just want to ask, because it just occurred to me, did, did we make any changes that anyone... Uh, BJ, are there any changes here? Okay, all right. Because we were thinking about possibly... And I forgot all about it. Um, ministering this a little bit differently. Okay, but let, let's bow for just a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to uh, examine our hearts.